Hello, welcome again uh, to our monthly virtual meeting of the Fort Worth Astronomical Society. I am Chris Modnitsky, uh, your president, and um, we're still pretty much stuck at home. So, uh, yeah, it's been it's been an interesting few months. Um, it's not getting any better right now, but places are opening up. Uh, we have made some changes as well to some things that we're doing, so we'll go ahead and, and go over that in just a bit. Um, I think we probably ought to get started, so let's see. Um, let's head and go on. So again, today, oh, did I do May 21st? Today is actually May 19th. Oh, my mistake. Let's see. Here we go. So. The usual bit. Uh, who is the A. Fort Worth Astronomical Society? This is for um, all the new people watching. Uh, we were established in 1949 by Miss Char Charlie Mary Noble, for whom the Noble Planetarium at the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History is named for. The Fort Worth Astronomical Society is one of the first adult amateur astronomy clubs formed in the United States, uh, and we are one of the largest astronomy clubs in the United States, and currently we have more than 140 individuals and families in our membership. Uh, our club used to be, or it was originally started as a children's club, and then all the adults wanted in. So now it's an adult club, so to speak. Our mission to actively promote the science of astronomy through outreach and education, uh, such as uh, free public star parties, other public events, museum presentations, and school presentations, to encourage and coordinate the activities of other groups interested in astronomy, to foster observational work and research among our members, and to foster craftsmanship in the construction of astronomical instruments, and to make such instruments available for the use of our, its members to the extent practical. We were formed for educational and scientific purposes for all individuals and all groups for the primary purpose of developing and implementing programs designed to increase the awareness and the knowledge of astronomy for all interested individuals, but specifically those living in and around Tarrant County, Texas, providing the opportunity for those individuals to pursue the science of astronomy in a dark sky observation site using club-owned equipment and providing an opportunity for all club members and guests to share their experiences and discoveries. So welcome to our May virtual meeting, courtesy of COVID-19. Remember the usual bits of advice, wash your hands, don't touch your face, self-quarantine as much as possible, wear a mask when going out. It is still dangerous, even though places are opening up, there is more of the virus out there than ever before. Um, the actual number of infections is greater than ever before. And so please be careful when you go out. We have two dark sky sites. Uh, we have one in Wise County uh, at the Thompson Foundation. And um, currently that is closed until further notice. Uh, because this is a private nature reserve, they are able to make the rules. So um, um, no one is allowed on the property at this time until they come up with some rules and procedures as to how uh, we need, we can or should use the property. Uh, Star Ranch in Stevens County, we did open it up this weekend. Um, we do have some rules for it and we will go over that in just a bit. Upcoming star parties. All public star parties are canceled. So we're not doing any public star parties at this time. Um, as soon as we are able to, based on expert advice, we will resume public star parties. Uh, in the meantime, I am doing the virtual star parties in my backyard. Uh, as time permits, as the sky permits. This weekend was a very, very nice weekend, uh, especially Sunday night and last night. Unfortunately, I did not have time to drag my stuff out. So I will do that in the future. And I have also borrowed from uh, Patrick our, uh, or the club's, hydrogen alpha telescope so i hopefully will be setting that up probably not this week because we're supposed to get rain until the early part of next week but um, when i do have some time and when the weather clears up during the day i will do a presentation during the day of the sun i will try to go ahead and have a white filter telescope and the hydrogen alpha telescope so we can see what the differences are looking at the sun with the two different ones. The white telescope may be a washout because we're not seeing a whole lot of sunspots on the sun right now. Uh, but we're doing the best we can, so 
Um, if anything pops up, that'll be good. If not, there are almost always prominences and flares. There's always stuff to see with the hydrogen alpha scope. Social media outreach, uh, the YouTube channel, is that you're on right now. So youtube.com uh, slash Fort Worth Astronomical Society and Facebook is Fort Worth Astro. I have not had a chance to work on the website. Um, I will be trying to do that soon. Um, while that has been a priority, I haven't had time to do any of my priorities for a bit because something else comes up and is a priority as well. I think we all know what that's like. So I have been working late many, many nights, but unfortunately it hasn't been to finish up the website. We'll do that as soon as I can. So let's talk about upcoming astronomical events. May 23rd, in a couple days, Comet Atlas makes its closest approach to Earth. Uh, it did fragment, and it got a little bit dimmer, and now it turns out that it got a little bit brighter again, I believe last week, so it's kind of up in the air. We don't know what, how it's behaving yet. Um, hopefully someone will be taking some pictures, but we will see. I think it's gonna be a washout for us here in North Texas, because again, we're supposed to have clouds and rain up until I think from tomorrow. I think it's from tomorrow until um, Monday or Tuesday of next week. But June 4th, we have Mercury at greatest Eastern elongation. So we just had the greatest Western elongation where we could see it at sunrise except for the fact that it would believe it was cloudy that day and now we're going to have um, the greatest eastern elongation where we can see it just after sunset so again make sure you're at a place where you can see the horizon and look and the horizon is clear and then just look out and it will be a little bit above and to the south of where the sun sets it's a little bitty bright dot but if the weather is good you should be able to see it and on june 5th we have the full moon not a good time to go out to the dark sky side set that or one dark sky side at that point because it pretty much washes out the entire sky um, it is the strawberry moon because it is the time when fruit starts to ripen and coincides with the strawberry harvesting season it's also known as the rose moon and the honey moon because oh, i guess a lot of people also get married in june so that's where the word honeymoon comes from on June 5th, we have a penumbral lunar eclipse. So this is where the moon passes through the outer portion of Earth's shadow. It will be slightly dark, but not completely. This is not a blood moon, and it will not be visible from North America. So if you're in Europe, Africa, Asia, Australia, uh, Indonesia, you may be able to see it. June 21st, we have the new moon, and this is a good time to go out to the dark sky site and take some photos or just look at the Milky Way. June 20th, we have the June solstice. And not sure why I swapped the order on there, but there we go. So the solstice, we will have the longest day and the shortest night. Um, this is the first day of summer for the northern hemisphere and the first day of winter for the southern hemisphere. And June 21st, we have an annular solar eclipse. So this is when the moon passes in front of the sun, but the moon is a little bit further away than usual, and so we see the ring of fire. Uh, we don't see the um, a total solar eclipse at this point. It is still not safe to look at the sun. We're not going to be able to see that either. So it, you'll be able to see it only if you're in Central Africa, through Saudi Arabia, northern India, and southern China, and then into the Pacific. So again, we don't get to see much now. Prime focus. So George Lutch is our editor. If you have any photos, articles, or ideas, please send them to George on the e-group and he will go ahead and be sure to add it in. Now it's time for the presentation. So I've been working on this for a while. Um, this is something that I started about, um, I think about a year and a half ago. And I've been kind of filling it out and filling it in and, and getting more uh, for it. So uh, I'm going to be talking about Mayan astronomy, kind of the history of how we got to um, to the Mayans, and kind of the influence of what the Mayans did um, around the rest of North America. And it's kind of interesting because it's something that's not usually taught in school. You don't usually hear about this, but we've discovered more and more about this in probably the last 20 years than we knew in the past hundred years. Easily that. 
uh, we're finding out more information and um, we're using something called archaeoastronomy. We're actually able to um, use some of these sites and see them as the original builders use them by actually standing there and um, looking out at the night sky in some cases, looking out at sunset and sunrise at various times of the year. So without further ado, let's uh, go ahead. Here we go. So mine astronomy. Oh, here we go. Sorry. Time. Time is kind of important. Time is what keeps everything from happening at once. If there was no time, the universe would only be static and unchanging. In order for anything interesting to happen, the flow of time is necessary. So today we measure time by seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years, decades, centuries, millennia, eons, and epochs. This measurement of time is important to us as a technological society. We rely on accurate timekeeping for our daily lives, when we wake up, when we go to work and school, when we eat lunch, when we go home, when we go to bed. Using very accurate, accurate clocks on satellites, we know exactly where we are on the planet down to the millimeter using clocks. Our ancestors all over the world track time as well. The first use of time was to know when to travel. Hunter-gatherers need to know when the seasons changed, when winter was over and spring began. If they left for the spring grounds too early, there'd be nothing to eat but ice and snow. If they left too late, everything would be gone. If they left for the wintering grounds too late, they could be trapped by the cold in the land without food. For them, morning, afternoon, and evening were accurate enough for the day, but they needed to know when it was time to move. Later, when our ancestors settled down in permanent villages and began to farm, they needed another measurement of time. They needed to know when to plant their crops, when to harvest. They needed to know when the rains would come or the river would flood so that their seeds would have the water they needed to grow. Plant too early and the soil is too dry or too cold for anything to grow, and plant too late, and winter comes before the crop can be harvested. Finally, our ancestors need an accuracy in measuring time that had been completely unprecedented. They needed to know when it was time to worship their powerful, fickle, and capricious gods. Every culture has their mythologies, their origin stories, and their explanations for how the universe works. For most, various gods are responsible for everything around them. The ground, the sky, the trees, the rocks, animals, water, the living, and the dead. Gods demanded special worship, and it was up to the humans to get it right, or else disaster would come. So how did our ancestors measure time? What did they measure to know when something happened? We use a calendar today to keep track of the days. How did they create the first calendars? What was the very first calendar, and why do we use it? What makes a calendar a calendar? The very first calendar was the sky at night, not the sun during the day. The sun is big and bright, and it's really hard to see changes in it over the long term because you really can't see it clearly in the short term. It's just there. It's bright enough that it's painful to look at except during the early morning or late evening when it's on the horizon or during the solar eclipse. But the sky at night, that's something else. That's something that can be observed easily as long as it's clear. The stars march across the sky from dusk to dawn. Day to day, there's little difference, but over a year, the stars cycle in and out, and eventually, everything returning to the same position. In the short term, the moon makes its way across the field of stars every 28 days, and its face and position against the stars changing daily. The very first, earliest calendars we have are markings on deer bone made by a knife. These carvings depict what could be the phases of the moon, arcs and pits dug into the bone. Many of these lunar calendars are made on small pieces of stone, bone, or antler, so they could be easily carried. These are small, portable, lightweight lunar calendars that could easily be taken on extended journeys such as long hunting trips and the seasonal migrations. The phases of the moon depicted in this set of marks are inexact. Precision is very difficult unless all nights were perfectly clear, which is unrealistic expectation. The arithmetic counting skill implied by these small lunar calendars is obvious. The recognition that there are phases of the moon and seasons of the year that could be counted, that they should be counted because they're important, is profound. Calendars record events where locations and time are important to, to the group. The time scale used on these earliest calendars is the phases of the moon because they're reliable and predictable, easily described with clarity, and require only minimal artistic skill to draw. The few powerful cosmic truths that were judged to be the most powerful and potent of all would still only be available to a few exceptionally initiated adults in the group. 
After all, upper level management has to maintain its power base. Learning about how ancient civilizations study the sky is called archaeoastronomy. The Maya. Who are the Maya? So the Maya are indigenous people of Mexico and Central America who have continuously inhabited the lands comprising modern Yucatan, down through uh, Campeche, Tabasco, Chiapas in Mexico, and southward to Guatemala, Belize, El Salvador, and Honduras. The de designation Maya comes from the ancient Yucatan city of Mayapan, the last capital of a Mayan kingdom in the post-classic period. The Maya people refer to themselves by ethnicity and language bonds, such as the Quiche in the south or the Yucatec in the north, but there are some others as well. So the mysterious Maya have intrigued the world since their discovery in the 1840s by John Lloyd Stevens and Frederick Catherwood, but in reality much of the culture is not that mysterious when it's understood. Contrary to popular imagination, the Maya did not vanish, and the descendants of the people who built the great cities, such as Chichen Itza, Bonampak, Uxmal, and uh, Altunha, still exist on the same lands their ancestors did and continue to practice in a modified form often, the same rituals which could be recognized by a native of the land a thousand years ago. The Olmec period. This era is known as the pre-classic or formative period when the Olmecs, the oldest culture in Mesoamerica, thrived. The Olmecs settled along the Gulf Coast of Mexico and began building great cities of stone and brick. The famous Olmec head strongly suggests highly sophisticated skill in sculpture and the first indications of shamanic religious practices date from this period. The enormous size and scope of the Olmec ruins gave birth to the idea that the land was once popular by giants. No one knows where the Olmecs came from or went or what happened to them. They lay the foundation for all the future civilizations in Mesoamerica. In the region surrounding modern-day Oaxaca, the cultural center now known as Monte Alban was founded, which became the capital of the Zapotec kingdom. The Zapotecs were clearly influenced by or maybe related to the Olmecs, and through them some of the most important cultural elements of the region were disseminated, such as writing, mathematics, astronomy, and development of the calendar, all of which the Maya would refine. During this era, the great city of Teotihuacan grew from a small village to a metropolis of enormous size and influence. Early on, early on Teotihuacan was the rival of another city called Cuicuilco, but when that community was destroyed by a volcano about 100 CE, uh, Teotihuacan became dominant in the region. Arche archaeological evidence suggests that it was an important religious center which was devoted to the worship of a great mother goddess and her consort, the Plumed Serpent. The Plumed Serpent, Kulkulkan, was also known later among the Toltecs and the Aztecs as Quetzcoatl, was the most popular deity among the Maya. Like many of the cities which now line, line ruin along the southern Americas, Teotihuacan was abandoned sometime around 900 CE. This period is also known as the Classic Period in Mesoamerican history. The name El Tajin refers to a great city complex in the Gulf of Mexico, which has been recognized as one of the most important sites in Mesoamerica. During this time, the great urban centers rose across the land and the Maya numbered in the millions. The very important ball game, which became known as Pocatoc, was developed and more ball courts have been found in and around the city of El Tajin more than anywhere else in the region. Who precisely the people who precisely the people were who inhabited El Tajin remains unknown, as there were over 50 different ethnic groups represented in the city, and dominance has been ascribed to both the Maya and the Tonatok. Sorry. Totonac. I have got to drink more. The Classic Maya Period. This is the area that saw the consolidation of power in the great cities of the Yucatec Maya, such as Chichen Itza, and Uxmal. Direct cultural influences may be seen in some sites from the Olmecs and the Zapotecs and the cultural values of Teotihuacan and El Tajin, but in others, a wholly new culture seems to have emerged, such as at Chichen Itza, where there's ample evidence of cultural borrowing, there's a significantly different style to the art and architecture. This period was the height of the Mayan civilization in which they perfected mathematics, astronomy, architecture, the visual arts, also refined and perfected the calendar. 
The oldest dates recorded here in the city of Tikal is 292 CE, and the latest is from an inscription in Tonina from 909 CE. City-states of the Mayan civilization stretch from Piste in the north all the way down to modern-day Honduras. The post-classic period. At this time, the great cities of the Maya were abandoned. <sighs> Thus far, no explanation for the mass exodus from the cities to outlying rural areas have been determined, but climate change and overpopulation have been strongly suggested, among other possibilities. The Toltecs, a new tribe in the region, took over the vacant city centers and repopulated them. At this time, Tula and Chitza Itza became dominant cities in the region. The widely popular conception that the Maya were driven from the cities by the Spanish conquest is erroneous, as the cities were already largely vacant by the time of the Spanish invasion. In fact, the Spanish conquistadors oops, had no idea the natives that they found in the region were responsible for the enormous complexes of the cities. The Quiche Maya were defeated in battle with the Spanish in um, 1524, and this date traditionally marks the end of the Mayan civilization. After the conquest of northern Yucatan, the southern Maya Itza kingdom still dominated the southern lowlands, where Tikal once ruled. Hostile their neighbors and ensconced in the forest, they were able to maintain their independence for nearly two centuries after the Spanish arrived. Mayans lasted from the pre-classical pre period, about 200 BCE to 250 CE, then the classic period from 250 CE to 909 CE. But there was a continuation of traditions from the Olmecs, so there's about 3,000 continuous years of culture in the Mesoamerican area. Something interesting that we see in Mesoamerican sites, temples and cities were built upon older temples and cities. So there's this idea that temples were placed along intersections of uh, what are called axis mundi, sacred lines of power that cross the world. So older temples were ritually destroyed to reset a locus, and the new temples were built on top of the remains. That way the new temples had all the power. So the city I want to talk about is Chichen Itza. In English, we typically emphasize the second to last syllable in the world in the word in a word unless it's a question. So mine is a tonal language with high and low tones in, that completely change the meaning of a word. Makes for some interesting puns as well, apparently. Typically the last syllable is emphasized, so we don't say chitsen itza, but we say chitsen itza. So it kind of sounds questiony. But Maya is a very sing-song kind of language. And apparently from, um, uh, from the way it sounds, uh, uh, Spanish speakers in Mexico think it sounds more like English than, uh, than it does Spanish. But anyway, so this is a city in northern central Yucatan. It's halfway between the coasts and a little bit down from the north coast as well. It's uh, an important city during the late classic through the early post-classic period from about 600 to 1200 CE, though it declined as a regional power after about uh, 1050 CE. The earliest discovered date there is equivalent of 823 CE, and the latest date is 998 CE. So this was one of the largest of the Mayan cities. Uh, with a mix of different architectural styles, different periods and influences, this is a very multicultural city full of people from all different backgrounds all over the Yucatan. Uh, it had a port on the northern coast that allowed trade on the circumpeninsular trade route, giving it access to goods like obsidian from central Mexico, gold from, central, um, from southern Central America. These cities were not isolated. They traded all over the place with other cities um, and much, much further away. They had trade goods from a very long distance, and they sold some of their own stuff um, a bit of a distance as well. Cat wants attention. So the structures that we're looking at were built right now uh, on the uh, left-hand side. They're built in different periods. We have Old Chichen down in the south. The structures on the western central areas are from the late Classic Maya period, and northern and eastern structures built later by the Toltec invaders. The columns in the group of 1,000 columns being a typical Toltec architectural feature. On the left, we can see three major structures, the Great Ball Court in the west, which is the largest Pocatoc court in Mesoamerica. It's just absolutely gigantic. Think of it like a, a stadium where the Super Bowl would be played. 
That's the equivalent uh, of that in Mesoamerica. In the center, we have uh, El Castillo, the castle, and uh, the later Toltec Temple of the Warriors in the Thousand Columns on the right. In the right side image, we have El Caracol, the snail. So we're going to focus on El Castillo and El Caracol, the two astron astronomical observatories in Chichen Itza. Something to see here, uh, neither structure, the pyramid or the observatory, are aligned to north. They're actually significantly off of the north-south axis, and that's actually on purpose. So the pyramid of Kukulkan. Uh, now, the Spanish called it the castle, uh, El Castillo, because to them, it, they really didn't know what a pyramid was. They didn't know what it was for. So it's a big stone building. Uh, it's kind of difficult to climb except among the, along the steps. So they said it looks like a castle. That's what they named it. But this is the pyra pyramid of Kukulkan, uh, the, the, the feathered serpent, the plumed serpent. And it was built before uh, 800 AD um, CE. It's easily the most impressive and widely recognized of the structures in Chichen Itza or really anywhere in the Mayan region. Um, so Kukulkan was the primary deity of Chichen Itza, but the cult spread far down south, uh, the Yucatan, down into Guatemala, and the spread of it helped facilitate trade throughout the region. The Mayans traded for cinnabar, which is a red mercury containing pigment um, used for certain holy objects, uh, mother of pearl and turquoise all over South America or Central America and further, uh, Mexico and, um, and, and even further north. The pyramid of Kukulkan was an observatory designed to keep track of the sun. It's a stepped pyramid, 79 feet high, tall, so that it rises above the flat jungle below so they can see the horizon. The horizon is really important. It's very important according to the Mayan creation story. It's the coming together place of the sky and the earth. It's where the gods of the underworld, the nine layers below, meet with those of the upper heavens, the 13 layers above. So nine and 13, those are going to be important. The horizon is the boundary between the underworld and the heavens, where we mortals dwell. So to see where the stars are, to see the exact place the sun and the moon rise and set, you need to be able to see the horizon. And the Mayans spent a lot of time observing the sun and the moon, knowing exactly when they were rising and setting before they built the temple. Because once you build it, that's it. You can't really tear it down and start all over if you make a mistake. So the steps were designed and the entire structure aligned so that on the spring and fall equinoxes, the nine steps cast a shadow onto the side of the staircase. In the morning, the sun casts a shadow of what looks like the undulating body of a serpent out, um, coming up out of the underworld, connected to the eastern head at the base of the stairs. At sunset, the effect was reversed with the undulating body of the serpent moving down towards the western head, down to the underworld. To us, this is a really interesting optical effect, a feat of math and engineering. To the Maya, this was really a religious miracle. This is a sped up time lapse of what's going on. And you can see it kind of coming. I'm not sure if it's coming out or coming in. I'm not sure how they were thinking about it. But nonetheless, it does kind of look like a snake. And if we look at it, here's the head. Here is the undulating body as it moves. These are the nine steps here that cast the shadow onto the body. The second sight. So the, the temple of, or the pyramid of Kukulkan was a warm up to building another observatory at Chichen Itza, El Caracol, Spanish for the snail. It's called that because the interior has a spiral staircase. It's a round building, or it does resemble a modern observatory, built around 906 CE, and for a long time, its use was a mystery. Many archaeologists thought this was a building for, um, for uh, that it was built as a granary for storage of maize and other foods, but it doesn't look like any other granary, not with the interior staircase and the outside perforated with holes. Now we know the structure was actually built for observations of Venus. In Mayan mythology, Venus was the sun's twin, and the god of war. It's a weird building. 
the side of the base doesn't face the four cardinal directions, and it's rotated by 27 and a half degrees. It's a round building and the largest round building in the city. The corners of the upper base aren't even square. One corner is off, just skewed. The horizon has no natural landmarks. It's flat like any other coastal plain. I don't know if you've ever been to Florida. It looks just like that. This is karst topography. It's limestone underneath. It's flat. If you want to see it, you have to be up high. So you have to build a building so you can see the horizon to point out celestial events. The rotation of the building lets the main entrance face exactly where Venus sets on the horizon at its northernmost point. This happens once every eight years. It's round. It simulates the horizon, lets observers inside see all around. And the T-shaped peepholes in the structure let observers see where Venus rises and sets. The upper base is skewed. One corner points out over here to where the sun rises on the summer solstice, and the opposite corner where the sun sets on the winter solstice. Mine astronomers knew from naked eye observations that Venus appeared on the western horizon and disappeared on the eastern horizons at different times in the year, and that it took 584 days to complete one cycle. They also knew that five of these Venus cycles equaled let's see, what was it? Uh, eight solar years. Venus would therefore make an appearance at the northerly and southerly extremes at eight-year intervals. Of 29 possible astronomical events, eclipses, equinoxes, solstices, etc., believed to be of interest to the Mesoamerican residents of Chichen Itza, sight lines for 20 of them can be found in the structure. Since a portion of the tower resting on El Caracol has been lost, it's possible that there were other observations that could have been made, but now we'll never really know. This was the height of Mayan astronomy, the last observatory built by the Maya. It's only a few years later, the start of the fall of the Mayan civilization began. So, we know the Mayas thought that knowing when things happened was important. When to plant, when to harvest, when to worship, when to go to war. How to predict the future and how to control it. And what do they do with that information? The Mayans created a calendar. The Mayans had 17 different calendars. First calendar is from about 300 BCE. So they have a 28-day lunar cycle, the 365-day solar cycle, which was the agricultural calendar. They had the 584-day Venus cycle. And they had the main calendar, the calendar round. Think of it as nested gears, all turning around and around and around. So the Mayans used a base 20 counting system, so there were 20 days. Then there was a second calendar of 13 days, one for each level of the heavens. This made for a 260-day cycle. Well, the agricultural calendar was 365 days, and 260 and 365 don't really match that well, as we think about it. But together, combined, they make for a 52-year cycle. These 52-year cycles were times of great worry. Did we sacrifice enough to the gods? Did we pray enough? Are the guards mad? Well, you, no one ever really knew until the Pleiades were directly overhead that night. If they were, then everything was well, and they could go on for the next 52-year cycle. So, I'm going to check out a video here. Let's make sure this works. And this is about the calendar round. Gradually, Firstman worked out how the Maya marked time, a system now called the calendar round. The calendar round is made up of three interlocking cycles, a 365-day solar year, a cycle of 20 names, and a cycle of 13 numbers. Days are designated by the way these three cycles line up. For example, this day is 3, Manique, and the 14th of the month, Pope, followed by 4, Lamat, 15, Pope, 5, Maluk, 16, Pope, and so on. 52 years will pass before the three cycles line up in the same way again. Then, these days will repeat. Like our days of the week, 
The calendar round cycles on and on forever. It is not by itself tied to any specific starting point in history. But Firstman's greatest triumph came when he realized that some very large numbers in the Venus pages of the Dresden were counts back in time. They tied the Venus records to an historical starting point thousands of years earlier. It fell on the calendar round day for a how eight kumku. From Maudsley's photographs, Firstman knew that this extraordinarily ancient date appeared throughout the Maya world, from Palenque in northern Chiapas to Quirigua in southern Guatemala. Firstman concluded that for the Maya, this date marked the creation of the universe. Just as Western culture measures its history from the birth of Christ, so the Maya measured their history from the date of creation. This system of dating is known as the long count. The long count calendar. So this is the uh, yet another calendar for the Mayans. One day is a kin. And then we have 20 days, which is an uinal, which is the equivalent of, let's call it a month. They would call it basically a month. So you take um, those uh, 20 ulial and multiply them by 13 for the number of levels in heaven, and you get 360 days, or one tun, which is one year. So 20 tun make up one katun, a generation. And 20 katun make one baktun, a landmark. So 13 baktun make one calendar cycle, or 5,125.36 years. And we translate that as a world. Really, the mind just called it a cycle. So the fifth world began on August 11th, 3000, or yeah, 3114 BCE, and it ended December 21st, 2012 CE. We're now in the Mayan sixth world. I don't know. Do y'all remember the end of the world back in 2012? Because uh, nothing happened. So Mayan scholars and natives dismissed the ap apocalyptic theories, noting that the end of the calendar would be regarded as a time of celebration, much like modern day New Year festivities. There was no, uh, there are also no Mayan in, 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 encryption, uh, there are no Mayan inscriptions or writings that predict the end of the world when the great cycle concludes. So what was the start of the Mayan calendar? Is there any special event for the start? No one really knows. So the Dresden Codex is one of four surviving Mayan books that were not destroyed by Catholic priests during the Spanish Inquisition. This one's named for the city where it was re rediscovered in, Dresden, Germany, and it's the most expansive one. So you can think of this like an early 13th century Mayan document, um, kind of like a farmer's arm almanac and a horoscope combined. This is the book that allowed us to translate and understand the Mayan calendar round. It seems to come from Chichen Itza because some of the hieroglyphs match ones that are only found there. The astronomical tables also appear to be based on the observatories there. This set has pages, uh, the set here, has eclipse tables to predict lunar eclipses on the left, though they were considered bad luck. In the middle are multiplication tables, and the far right uh, seems to depict a flood. So the tables for the movements of Venus and Mars are accurate to about 99.9% .9 or a hundred years into the future from the book's perspective. That's about two hours of error over that period of time. That's not bad. And the almanac's, almanac portions told them uh, when they were supposed to plant their crops. So this appears to be based on previous documents written about 300 to 400 years beforehand during the classic Maya period towards the end of um, the, uh, uh, the observatory building in uh, Chichen Itza. So the collapse, starting about 909, which is three years after the uh, observatory was completed, uh, the Mayan civilization began to collapse. In less than 80 years, cities began to be abandoned. So we think it was a number of factors. Climate change is one. The Yucatan became hotter and drier, so it made life a lot more uncomfortable in the cities and also decreased crop yields. 
lots of interdicting warfare. The city-states were almost constantly at war because the calendar told them when to go to war. Venus was the god of war, so the start of a new Venus cycle meant it was time to start a new campaign every eight years. That's going to kill off a lot of your men. If every eight years you have to go off to the late neighboring city-states and fight and capture captives to come back and sacrifice them to your gods. So overpopulation also led to environmental degradation. The land could no longer support so many people. Traditional techniques of farming were not sufficient anymore, and overfarming made the limestone karst tropical soil infertile, so crop yields decreased quickly. <sighs> people abandoned the cities and the observatories were no longer used. Afterwards, the Toltecs moved into some cities and made them their own. The legacies. Now, here's something kind of interesting. In the American Southwest, we have the Anasazi, or the ancestral Pueblo people, who built stone and earth dwellings along cliff walls, especially during the Pueblo II and III periods, of 900 uh, CE to about 1350 CE during and soon after the collapse of the Maya, and I'll talk about why this is important in just a little bit. This is at Chaco Canyon in New Mexico, and we have many of the buildings aligned to passages of the sun and moon for solstices in particular. We have a Casa Rinconada here. This is a very large kiva. It's a circular room used for ceremonies. There are kivas, and then there are great kivas, and unlike the vast majority of kivas, Casa Rinconada is not embedded in a large building complex, but it stands on top of a small hill a good distance away from the other large buildings. It also sits partially above ground, unlike most kivas in which the roof is at ground level. Casa Rinconada is a little over 20 meters in diameter and 4 to 5 meters deep, making it one of the largest known great kivas. So, the geometrical care put into planning and building this goes far beyond anything else encountered at Chaco Canyon. The symmetry axis defined by the two T-shaped doors align with the north-south line to within about 20 minutes of a degree. Notice the T-shaped doors. We have similar T-shaped openings down in the Yucatan uh, for observing from these observatories. So, the small niches lining the interior wall are also equally spaced in position so that lines defined by opposing pairs of niches all have their center within 10 centimeters of the kiva center, which also indicates that the kiva walls depart very little from a perfect circle. The circular masonry foundation sockets for the four post, um, for the roof on the kiva floor, easily seen there in the image, form a square also centered on the kiva center within 10 centimeters with the sides oriented within 30 minutes of either north-south or east-west axes. And Casa Rinconada is thought to have been designed as a physical representation of the Anasazi cosmos and was likely used for important religious ceremonies involving the larger uh, Chacoan community. On the solstice, a window in the kiva precisely illuminates a niche on the far wall. And nearby here in Chaco Canyon, research found a pictogram on a rock wall that appears to indicate a supernova explosion. The orientation of the crescent moon and stars indicate that this could represent the formation of the Crab Nebula from 1054 CE by a supernova. So Chaco Canyon was seen as first as just a trade center, but with a lot more research into archaeoastronomy, it also seems to be a center of astronomy and cosmology. Hovenweep National Monument in Utah is a major Pueblo culture site on the Utah-Colorado border. By about 1160 CE, large towers were being built. So 19th century explorers thought these were castles for protecting springs or water supplies at first. Then they were thought to be granaries, but there's no storage areas inside and the small holes on the outer walls indicate something else. With archaeous astronomical research, we now think that these towers were observatories. Certain times of the year, the sun shines through holes in the wall and the light falls on a marker. Some holes mark the winter solstice, sunrise and sunset, as well as moon and planets on the horizon. Interestingly, the equinox port at Hovenweep Castle 
It points to the sunrise azimuth four days after the vernal equinox. This is precisely what one would have expected if the vernal equinox was established by counting and having the number of days between the winter and the summer solstices. The connections to the Maya. So, corn horticulture spread from Mesoamerica up through Mexico into the southwest and then into uh, the eastern part of what's now the United States. Trade goods from Mexico found in southwestern archaeological sites. Parrot bones and feathers. I don't know about you, but I don't recall parrots being native to the Four Corners area. However, we do find their bones and feathers in archaeological digs. Copper bells used in the worship of Tlaloc, a Mayan god, uh, have also been found in Anasazi and Pueblo sites. Copper bells were used for worshiping Tlaloc, and copper is very, very rare in the set. Well, it's relatively rare in the Southwest, but it is not that rare down in, um, uh, in Central America. We also have shells from the Gulf of Mexico. And again, we typically don't find shellfish in the middle of the Four Corners area. In addition, we have something from the Southwest in the Yucatan. So turquoise from southwestern mines has been found in Mayan temples. Mexico doesn't have a whole lot of, of turquoise, but the interesting thing about turquoise is uh, its chemical composition is unique to where it comes from. What that means is you can take a piece of turquoise and you can analyze it. And once you know its chemical composition, you can compare it to turquoise found all over the world and find where it best matches. And it, so the turquoise from one mine is typically very, very similar chemically. So we know now that um, some of the turquoise down in the Yucatan that the Maya used came from the southwest. Obsidian spear points can also be traced to specific volcanoes. So we know that um, the obsidian, some of the obsidian used both in uh, the um, Anasazi areas and in the Yucatan came from volcanoes closer to central Mexico. There aren't typically a lot of volcanoes in the Yucatan. There are architectural similarities. So Mayan temples, uh, temple pyramids, compared to the lower Colorado and the Gila River summit paths. These are large man-made mounds, uh, both being derivative of the spirit mountain idea where the gods, spirits, and mans could communicate on top of a large mountain or hill, artificial or not. Uh, the architectural use of the tea window is associated with the ik, the breath of life, and it's a portal into the spirit world. We find these in Mayan cities and temples all over the place. We also find them in Mesa Verde, um, Montezum Castle, and in Chaco Canyon. And in this one picture we have here on the left, we have a pictogram of the Mayan god Tlaloc, found in New Mexico. So when you trade in goods, you're also trading in ideas. Um, think about it this way. In our modern culture, we sell products and goods. One of the things that we sell is um, films and music, popular culture. Uh, we make movies, we make uh, music, and then we take those and we sell them all around the world. That disseminates American culture to other places. And so what you find is um, a, a, an assimilation where ideas that started here are picked up by other places and then modified. So you see stuff like uh, um, in the United States, you had athletic wear and leisure wear, and then that passes around to other places in the world. And in Japan, it becomes streetwear and a whole streetwear culture around it. And then you have that streetwear culture come back to the United States. Uh, with Hollywood and films, you have the, the Hollywood ideals, I guess you can call it, um, a particular way of looking, of, of dressing, of acting um, around the world, and people see that as a representation of the United States. What we see here is the idea that the, the Mayans were able to trade with other areas, not just with um, Central, and, uh, um, or Central America, uh, Central Mexico, but there were trade routes that went around the Gulf Coast. We see um, shells, 
we see um, Mayan artifacts and, and, and trade goods going up to the Anasazi. So we have a trade route that goes around the Gulf of Mexico, through central Mexico, and up into the Four Corners area. We have the Circum Gulf Trade Network, which goes around the Gulf of Mexico, basically from Yucatan to Florida. We have the Mississippi trade route that goes from um, basically along the Mississippi, Mississippi River all the way up to Wisconsin. And then we have a trade route that goes from Oklahoma all the way across to South Carolina. And it's goods being moved back and forth. And we can find, let's say, we, we find shells from the Gulf Coast up in Wisconsin. We find the copper bells from the Yucatan in uh, the American Southwest. Um, we have parrots from the Yucatan in the American Southwest. And then we have turquoise from the Southwest all the way back down in the Yucatan. So while people are going back and forth, they're not just trading the goods, they're trading the ideas. And one of the ideas is you can look at the sky and it will tell you something about what's going on. You can build calendars just by standing in one place and recording where planets, where stars, where the sun, where the moon uh, show up on the horizon. And this whole idea of, um, of astronomy we see disseminated. So about 900 or so CE, when the Mayan civilization began to collapse, um, we can see an, an exodus of the ideas. And on the next slide, we can talk about Cahokia. So Cahokia is a major site. It's across the river from St. Louis on the Mississippi. It's a Mississippi River civilization that thrived about 700 CE to about 1300 CE and its peak around 1250 CE or so. It was actually larger than London. It was one of the great cities of the world. And then it collapsed. So it centered on these trade routes from Wisconsin to the Gulf, from the Atlantic to Oklahoma, the Gulf Coast from Florida to the Yucatan. Remember, and rivers have always been major trade routes. So I don't know about you, but um, there ain't much in the way of hills or mountains or even stone around the St. Louis area. What you have is a lot of dirt. And so the mound builders there built pyramidal mounds, the largest of which is called Monk's Mound. It's 10 stories high. It's four steps. And similar to the Mayan pyramids, it's a step pyramid, and it rises high above flat lands so they can see the horizon. Also, like the Maya, there was a whole lot of human sacrifice at Cahokia. So that's another cultural idea that got passed around. In Cahokia, we also have structures called Woodhenge. And there are actually several Woodhenges, um, not just one. So we know of at least five different circles, and there are large wooden posts surrounding a central wooden post. So Woodhenge 1 had 24 posts, about 204 feet in diameter, located away from the others. Eventually, it was dismantled and a mound built on top of it. Woodhenge 2 had 36 posts, 408 feet in diameter. Woodhenge 3 had 48 posts, 410 feet in diameter. You can see they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger, more posts. This is a picture of the reconstructed one um, there for Woodhenge 3. The 48 posts of the circle, they're set uh, seven and a half feet apart as measured from the uh, geometric center of the circle. Oh, sorry, uh, seven and a half degrees apart. Um, the central post is, of the circle is offset from the true center by about 5.6 feet to the east, and that actually facilitates the alignment uh, with the perimeter posts marking the winter and summer solstice sunrise positions and correcting for the latitude of Cahokia's location. Woodhenge 4 had 60 posts, 476 feet in diameter, and Woodhenge 5 was an arc of just 13 posts facing the sunrise. It could have had 72 posts and be 446 feet in diameter. It might not have been a, a full circle as large trees were in the area were becoming scarce at the time. If you cut down all your trees to make wood hinges, you're not going to be able to build buildings. Um, so the circles aligned with solstices and equinoxes with the sun rising uh, from behind the monk's mound during the equinoxes. The posts are eastern cedar red, which is resistant to decay, disease, and insects. And traces of red ochre mean that they were painted red. We had red sticks, 
and uh, lots of other cultures later on used red sticks to mark hunting territories. We still have a town known as Red Stick now. If you can recall, there's a town there on the Mississippi in Louisiana called Baton Rouge, Red Stick. So the, uh, later on, the natives in the area, they also used red sticks in the river to mark out fishing territories. And when the, um, when the French found them, they found red sticks sticking out. Figure, eh, easy enough to name it after that, so they called the town Baton Rouge. Uh, there are a lot more posts in the wood hinges that are actually needed for solstice and equinox alignments. So some could have been used for other purposes, aligned with the stars, with Pleiades, lunar cycles. Um, we just don't really know yet. There's still research going on into this. And, um, well, that's kind of all I got. Um, I don't know if anyone's got any questions. I'll take a quick look. I don't see, uh, I don't see any questions going on. So, um, that's kind of the, the idea that, uh, that a lot of archaeologists have now is that um, you have this buildup of culture in Central America with the Maya, and then when it collapsed, people just went away. Um, most of them stayed in the area. They moved out in the rural areas, but there are always going to be people who just want to go further, just want to escape. And when they did, they took their culture, their ideas with them. So when you go to the Anasazi, when you look at what they did, um, they have hills. They don't need to build great mounds um, or build pyramids to see the horizon. They can just get up on a hill and they build structures there where they are able to sit in the middle and look out at the horizon at certain points and see Venus is rising here, the sun rises here. And they're able to make calendars out of that. Uh, when you go to Cahokia, um, it's flat, just like the Mayans had with the, uh, with the coastal plains. But again, there's no stone out there, so you build with whatever you have available. The Mayans had lots of limestone. You build out of limestone. The, the mountain builders in Cahokia had dirt. You build it out of dirt. All you want to do is be able to get up high off the horizon, so that um, sorry, off the ground so you can see the horizon. And we do the exact same thing with observatories now. Uh, we, have, we either put them on mountains, so we can see the horizon and get above as much of the air as possible. Or we build uh, taller buildings to get off the ground so we can um, see more of the horizon, more of the sky, without all the trees getting in the way. But it is interesting. And again, this is something that um, we've just pretty much found out really the last 20, maybe 25 years. Uh, I know that when I went to school, um, we talked about Cahokia and the, the mound builders there, um, but not really any of the astronomy. Um, with the Maya, we talked about human sacrifices, we talked about the, the pyramids, and then they, they vanished, they disappeared, but um, we didn't really know about their astronomy very much, uh, if anything at all. Um, so this is, this is new stuff that we're learning, um, and I find it very, very interesting and uh, I'm, I'm hoping that everyone who, who watched learned something and uh, found it at, at least as, as interesting as, as I do. <sighs> so, I need a drink. <sighs> nice cup of cold tea. And we can go on to the club business portion. Star Ranch. Uh, we talked about it last week at the board meeting. And... Um, it, ha it is open, but with precautions. Uh, 15 people max. It is a fairly decent sized site, but we do need to separate out. Um, minimum 10 feet separation. I know the recommendation is keep six feet away. Honestly, the, the further away, the better. Uh, wear a mask if anybody is out there. The ma my mask protects you, your mask protects me. There was actually a study which just came out this weekend where just by wearing surgical masks, uh, infection rates were reduced by 75%. So the masks aren't to keep you from breathing in uh, virus particles so much as to keep you from breathing it out, coughing it out onto everyone else. So if everyone is wearing them, the viruses tend to stay in the masks as opposed to going out everywhere. Please don't share your equipment because that does spread 
any virus if uh, someone is infected and doesn't know it. Um, there have been people who uh, are infectious or have been infectious, but have not shown any symptoms. Um, and again, you can become infectious before showing any symptoms. So you can go around and, and get other people sick without even knowing that you're about to be sick yourself. Uh, I actually have a, a, a epidemiologist friend and I spoke with him last week specifically about this kind of stuff. And, and his recommendation was, um, if you don't have to do it, don't do it. Uh, especially here in Texas with our, our infection rates rising, our numbers rising. Um, but if you have to, use these sensible precautions. So um, don't share personal equipment. Um, stay away from other people's telescopes, even if they've got something really, really cool in the eyepiece. Uh, and if you're going to borrow any club equipment there uh, from the shed, uh, either take it and clean it. Use um, use like a, a Clorox wipes or something or, or a hand sanitizer on a wipe to, to clean it all off, any part that you touch. Or go ahead and, and tag it out, put a, um, a note on it saying uh, who you are and when you last used it. The, the virus can uh, live several days on materials, so if we have it away from everyone else, if no one touches it for a week or so, hopefully that'll be um, good enough to, to get rid of it, uh, to, to destroy any virus particles on there. Thompson Foundation, again, no club use until further notice. Uh, their, um, their organization is looking right now at plans on how to reopen, but they don't have those completed yet, and they're not allowing anyone onto the property. So again, all public star parties at Tandy Hills, Dinosaur Valley, and other locations, they're canceled. Um, I am doing the virtual star parties as time and weather permit, and uh, if you would like to know when that's gonna happen, go ahead and subscribe to the Facebook and YouTube pages. I'll go ahead and update those. Um, I will try to update them at least a day ahead of time uh, before I do it. I will try not to do anything last minute. Um, I, I would like to get people to, to plan for it as opposed to spring it on them. Um, I do have the solar telescope, the, the hydrogen alpha scope, so um, hopefully when the weather's going to be clear during the day and I've got time, I'll just uh, I'll take a, a, a lunch break and go outside and have everything set up and, and broadcast out a, uh, a solar viewing party and um, I see how well that goes. We are available, specifically I am available for private virtual star parties or outreach presentations um, using Zoom. And actually last Monday uh, we had a request for a Cub Scout meeting and I was able to do that. So I actually did a presentation on media rights for them um, from, I believe they were kindergarten to fourth graders. And I was able to show them some of the media rights afterwards. So we talked a little bit about why media rights are important, uh, what we can find out from media rights, how we know where they came from. And then I had several of my media rights out and we could look at them and talk about them and, and, and see an actual meteorite under the camera. It is a lot more impressive when you get to hold them, but uh, we're not able to do that now. So this was the next best thing. So COVID-19 updates. Um, these are the numbers from last night that I got. Uh, 47,800 almost uh, people who are confirmed infected. Uh, when we looked at other states, we can see that the confirmed infection rates are uh, much lower than the probable ones because as soon as there are enough kits to start testing with, and uh, especially with testing random people, um, they're finding that infection rates are much higher than they expected. So, and in Texas, we have 27,570 who have recovered so far and uh, 1,336 uh, deaths. Across the United States, we have over 1.5 million confirmed infected. Um, almost 300,000 who have recovered, and more than 90,000 who have died worldwide. Almost 5 million confirmed, 1.8 million recovered, and almost 320 who have died. 320,000, sorry, who have died from this. So again, um, 
last year's flu season had um, almost one third the deaths that we have had just in the past couple of months. So the virus does not spread itself, people spread it. So please let's reduce the spread, social distancing as much as possible, minimize unnecessary contact. I know that stores are reopening. I know that restaurants are reopening. I know that bars are reopening. And you know, one of the things that, um, that we've been hearing, that I've been hearing uh, from my epidemiologist friend and others is uh, you know, people are talking about a second wave. Um, you can't really have a second wave if the first one never, never finishes. So uh, we're also looking at a, uh, another possible wave in September when we have the, the next flu season coming in. So uh, be considerate of not just our members um, who have relatives who are immunocompromised, but the rest of the public. So please, let's, let's just be careful. Next meeting in June, we have our elections. Um, last week at the um, board meeting, we talked about the nominating committee. And anyone who would like to be a part of the nominating committee can join. The president is de facto a member of every committee. So um, it's uh, usually the officers in the board. And we are looking for um, all offices and three board positions are up for election. So we currently have candidates for some of those. We are still looking for the secretary position. Um, if you would like to serve, please let one of the officers or board members know as soon as possible. So we go ahead and plan this. Uh, we are not having any plans for delaying the election at this time. Um, I don't think it's necessary. The board did not think it was necessary last week when we discussed it. We will be doing electronic elections. There's no way that we can meet there's no way to do easily um, mail-in ballots. We're looking at several different options right now. Uh, and the plan right now is we'll figure out exactly what we'll do with the next week to two weeks. Um, we, at two weeks to 10 days before the uh, next meeting in June, uh, we will send out a link to everyone um, who is on the Night Sky Network, and uh, they will be able to vote using that link. Um, no Chicago rules. It's not vote early, vote often. Uh, it is um, uh, one membership, one vote. And once the vote is made, uh, you can't come back and use the same link to vote again. At the June meeting, we will go ahead and cut off the voting at, let's say, eight o'clock. So the meeting starts at seven. I will remind you, please go vote. If you haven't voted already, we will make the cutoff at eight o'clock. And once the cutoff is made, uh, I will, in the middle of the meeting, um, go ahead and log in and we will all see the tally together or as close enough together as I can. Um, because there is actually a 25 to 30 second delay between what I see now, what I say now, and when it goes actually live over YouTube. It is what it is, it's not perfect. It's a bit of a delay, but that's fine. Um, so we want to have that kind of transparency. Um, transparency is relatively easy when everyone is there. We can do a hand count. Uh, if there's um, any question about it, we can go ahead and do a paper ballot and count it out right there and have everything done. When it's electronic, it's a little bit more difficult but if we put safeguards in and then we do the uh, we can present that live um, everyone sees it at the same time there's no chance for manipulation i would not expect any manipulation in this club uh, we've been doing this for a long time there's really no need uh, june will also be my last month as president so i'm happy to be taking a break from this uh, and pass it off to someone else. I will be helping. So um, if uh, the next president would like to have presentations, something similar to this, I can have that set up. I can have templates and show you how I do it. Um, and that pretty much goes for all the positions. So we want to be able for the next generation of leadership to be able to come in and take over and um, follow along uh, 
what we've done before so there's not a jarring transition there's a easy transition if you have never served in office we will help you uh, I had never served in uh, in a club and nonprofit uh, office before I did this bit of a jump isn't it starting off at the top but um, it has been a lot of fun and I have enjoyed it and um, I hope that you've enjoyed me being your president as well we do need someone to um, uh, run for the secretary position. At least one person, please. Uh, we do need club members to serve as officers. Um, uh, we don't get officers from the outside. We don't pay the officers, so sorry about that. Um, but we do need club members to step up and, um, and help with governance and, and club duties. So uh, Pam has a run book available on the secretarial duties. So it includes instructions on task duties, anything important information about the club. Uh, everything is in, in one location. Um, it's, parts need to be filled out still, but the advantage is everything is, is, if it's not in there now, it will be in there. And it's a good place to start. You're not starting from scratch. There is something for you to step into. Okay, treasurer report from John. This is what John sent me last night. We have a total of fifty-seven thousand one hundred thirty-one and five cents, uh, ten thousand eight hundred seventy-six in checking, and forty-five thousand nine hundred seventy-four in savings. So we have had a number of uh, renewals, um, and that has gone uh, into the coffers. So we currently have one hundred forty-three members. Um, one hundred thirty-three are standard members and 10 are special members. So John last week presented the 2019 financial report to the committee um, and talked about it. So uh, he has sent out some uh, renewal notices for dues, I believe. I'm trying to remember. Uh, oh, and uh, also, let's see. All right, hold on. Let's get this done first. So we have renewal notices for dues. We have the Astronomical League payment due in June. And he is also working on Google Apps for nonprofits. So uh, this would allow us to have uh, documentation online. This would be living documents. Uh, these are documents that we'd be able to go into and edit, for example, the run book, to update it as needed, add in more content as necessary. Uh, and as a living document, that allows the edits. Um, PDF files are fine for uh, archival documents, but they're not very good for living documents. You can't take a PDF and start editing it and, and then re-upload it. You have to have the source document and then you export as a PDF. PDF is your final version. The PDF is what you print out. PDF is your archive. Um, living documents are constantly being modified. Um, you can have a version that goes out as your PDF but as soon as you make a change to your uh, original document, that one is now out of date. So Google Apps allows us to have spreadsheets, to, allows us to have um, uh, text documents that we can go in and edit as needed. Anyone can go in there. We can assign permissions. So um, if you're a new member and you would like to have information on, let's say, one of the Dark Sky sites, you can go in there. You can take a look. And it will detail information about not only where it is and how to get into there, combinations uh, to locks, things like that. But for now, um, we have the COVID-19 information in there as well, how to protect yourself and how to protect everyone else in the club from the virus. And I have something on here. Um, Michelle's mentioning that the bylaws do provide voting by proxy. Uh, the rules in there for voting by proxy uh, we're specifically about um, if you are not able to make it to a meeting, you can provide information to another club member who can vote on your behalf for the candidate or candidates of your choice. I don't think we ever considered a situation like this where we would not be able to meet in person anymore. So um, we're going to have to do the best we can. And voting electronically 
you, we can interpret that as a system of voting by proxy. We are using a another system to cast our votes. We are handing our vote to a proxy system, um, which will then be tabulated for the final results. So, I think we're um, I think we're going to be good on that. At this point in the uh, meeting, in the physical meeting, I would typically ask if the board had any announcements. If there are any members that had any announcements, if there are any questions from the audience. I have a cat. He's not really asking any questions. He is yowling. He is going to the litter box. I really hope he doesn't go to the litter box. Please don't go to the litter box. You just went to the litter box. Why are you going to the litter box? He went in the litter box. Okay. In the meantime, if anyone has any questions, uh, let's see. Um, Steve and Pam asking any word on when UNT will become available. Uh, let's see, we talked about this uh, during the last meeting. We got some more information. And no, we don't really have anything. And the, I believe John tried to contact the, uh, the person there who took our check. And we were supposed to be refunded for... Um, at least May through uh, June, sorry, March through June, um, March through May, I believe. So it was supposed to be refunded for at least three months. Um, that has not happened. It may be a credit in the future. We don't know yet. The problem is that um, we can't actually get in touch with anybody. And this seems to be a case with a lot of organizations, especially the ones that have shut down and have furloughed some of their employees. Um, they're not answering phone calls at their desks. They're not at their desks anymore. A lot of them don't even have access to their emails anymore. So we can email them, they're just not responding. They, they just don't get them. So um, there's not really much we can do until we hear from way up high in the organization that they're reopening or that they, they are available. For now, this is limbo. On the plus side, it's not a huge amount of money. On the downside, it's our money, and uh, we would like it back. I'm sure we will eventually get it back. I, I don't think this is gonna be a, um, a major issue to get it back uh, or to get a credit for the next year or whatever it's going to be. Um, we also talked about looking at other, um, um, other venues on where we can go. Um, and we don't really have any options uh, at this time. And the idea was if, if UNT is, is shut down, um, if they're not going to reopen or if they're not going to allow meetings like this in the future, is there another place we can go where we could spread out more? Um, the site in Arlington on Sanford where the uh, Astrophotography Special Interest Group meets monthly, uh, met monthly, I should say, um, that remains a possibility. Um, apparently, they are opening to certain groups, to small groups. We need to see if that's still what we want to do. Um, I'm not certain it's something I want to do quite yet. Uh, I'm quite happy uh, staying at home. I'm staying at home as much as possible, uh, leaving as little as possible. Uh, we're doing our shopping online, getting it delivered. Uh, if we have to go to the pharmacy, we go through the drive through um, If we go out to the park, we go way out to parks that no one else goes to, and we stay away from anybody who happens to be out there. We wear masks when we're out. Um, we're, we're trying not to get sick, and we're also trying to um, not get other people sick in case we are. Uh, I uh, We actually did... Um, get uh, blood tests and we are negative i want to stay that way for absolutely as long as possible and so we are taking as many precautions as we can uh let's see um i am looking at the chats okay so we have uh any word presentations yes uh thank you ed we need more presentations uh, if you have any ideas for presentations, if you have a, uh, a presentation in your back pocket that you've done a while ago, 
that you can update and redo. That would be absolutely fantastic. Uh, please let me know, let Ed Gill know, and we can go ahead and get that set up. Um, one of the neat things about this is that I can actually have a Zoom meeting feed. Uh, we did this at the last meeting. Um, Jerry Gardner was able to do a presentation from the comfort of his own house. He didn't have to leave. He didn't have to come over here. Uh, we did everything from, from his house. I was able to do the, uh, the regular part of the presentation and then pass control to him. He was able to uh, go through his entire presentation. We were able to talk back and forth and uh, then relinquish control back to me and complete the, the, uh, the, the meeting. Uh, that is entirely doable. We can actually do that with multiple people. I think we've had uh, uh, myself and three others on one of the star parties where we could pass the, uh, uh, the screen share back and forth between our different machines and have audio going on as well. So this is all feasible. You don't actually have to come over to my house to get this thing done. We can always do it uh, totally remotely now. Isn't technology grand? Let's see. Mike is asking, could treasurer and secretary duties be combined, doubling John's pay? I'm pretty sure I can see steam coming out of John's ears right now. So probably not the best of ideas. Uh, one of the ideas in separation of duties is that uh, one person can't control everything. So we do have separation of duties. Um, treasurer is a, is a big job already. Secretary is a big job already, and I don't see that as being feasible, especially since we already changed the uh, the bylaws back in the um, uh, beginning part of this year to allow the secretary to designate, um, oh, I forget what term we used, um, a subaltern almost, uh, where they could um, uh, pass certain duties to other club members um, in order to do things like take notes during the meetings or handle um, new membership. So uh, if the secretary is already passing out duties to help with the caseload, um, with the workload, then um, I don't think combining it with the treasurer is going to make anybody happy at all. And Michelle is saying that we were split, that it is too much for one person to handle. Uh, we had, um, let's see, Stephen Pammer saying that there used to be meetings, uh, FFA, FAA meetings at a room in TCU. I remember in the past we used to meet at the um, uh, Botanical Gardens in one of the meeting rooms and either it became, I think Phil mentioned that it was either too expensive there for us or that uh, there was enough space for us that there were, we had too many people there in the room. Um, but I do recall some, some meetings held back there. Any other questions? Um, I don't see any other questions. It is nine, or sorry, 826, 825. Um, I don't really have a whole lot else. Um, I can't really think of anything. Um, uh, the, the board meeting, um, Last week went well. We were able to do it as a Zoom meeting. And, um, oh, I remember. Uh, if you would like to, uh, there is a uh, link to the Zoom meeting in the email that I sent the club members. So this is a, a club member only Zoom meeting. If you would like to use it, if you would like to chat, I do believe it's available. If not now, it may be available in a few minutes. Um, I don't think there's a waiting room. You don't have to wait for me. You can just go ahead and go in there and, um, and chat away. So this is kind of our, our social time. This is, think of it as a time uh, after the club meeting at UNT where we just kind of sit around and, and wait until we get yelled at uh, that security is coming and we better vacate the premises. In this case, though, we don't have to vacate. We can stay as long as we want. Um, you do not have to come if you would like to. Um, that's absolutely fine. If you are done with Zoom meetings, if you are Zoomed out, as people are saying, you absolutely do not need to show up. Um, but just think of this as uh, once a month, we can, we can talk, we can hang out, we can relax for a bit and see who's been up to what, uh, not just off of uh, the e-group, but actually see each other's faces. 
I realize that is also rather unusual uh, for some of us because uh, some of us are only voices and silhouettes in the dark, uh, especially the people who don't show up or did not show up to the monthly meetings. I will say it is kind of lonely. Um, it is kind of weird as well, sitting here and talking into a microphone that looks like um, uh, Don King. Let's see. This is my Don King microphone. I have a little uh, fur hat on it because it is very effective as a windscreen when I'm doing the star parties out in the backyard uh, and there's just a little bit of wind. Otherwise, you just hear on the microphone all the time and it's really, really annoying. Um, I have a nice little setup here. I have a bunch of cameras staring at me and I can switch between them. But it is rather lonely. Uh, some social interaction would be nice. Um, I am working from home, have been since March, and we have our daily Zoom meetings. But human interaction, uh, it's just not the same without it. Uh, so I know we're all tired. I know we're, we're all getting sick of this, but it is still necessary. So I plan on staying home for as long as possible, as long as it's necessary because uh, I want to stay safe and um, I would like others to stay to stay safe as well uh, and I think I think we're good so uh, I'm gonna call it it is almost 8 30 uh, thank you everyone and um, for anyone who wants to I guess I will see you in a few minutes on the zoom chat so um, Good night, clear skies, uh, except for the next week we got rain. But hopefully after that we'll be clear again and we will go out. Uh, if you do go out to the Dark Sky site, please, please, please take precautions. Be safe. Um, stay away from me if I'm out there, and I probably won't be out there. Oh, and, and oh, I have one last thing. This is regarding the star parties. It'll be really fast. Um, last weekend... Um, yeah, last weekend I went down to my cousin's place in Grandview. Uh, they have been isolated and isolating. Um, so um, uh, I was able to test out the internet connection there. It is a much darker sky than it is here in, uh, in Burleson. Um, it's, I think, a light green on the scale. So it's probably a little bit brighter than Thompson, but not too much brighter. And uh, I have power and I have internet down there. And I just need some time. Um, I need a good Saturday, and I can go down there and I can set up and I can do a star party from a little bit darker skies. Uh, the internet's fast enough, power's good enough, and I can sit up there. There's no one around. Um, it should be pretty quiet, no bright lights. We can shut down everything, and uh, we can do a nice little star party and hopefully be able to see some more objects than what we can just here from the city. Uh, so I'm planning on that, um, and oh, also the website. Terribly sorry from lack of time. I have not gotten a chance to work on the website. Um, that is on the plan. I will keep at it. I think I mentioned at the beginning. All these days are flowing together, aren't they? It's all coming together and just one big mess. One big long day is what it seems like. I think I need a calendar. Maybe I'll go in for the Maya. All right, I'm done. Have a good night, everyone. And um, please, stay safe.